it's the Belknap class. That's fun. It is fun. They are a interesting class. They, I would be tempted, under other circumstances, probably to call them the Leahy class 2. Batch 2s. Because they are very, very similar to the Leahy's. Very similar to the Leahy's. But there is one big difference. These ships get a 5-inch gun. And, honestly, getting a 5-inch gun makes all the difference to my mind. The 5-inch gun is a very critical addition. Mainly because you can't get anything which screams more U.S. Navy destroyer than a 5-inch gun. Anything, you actually you can't get anything which screams more U.S. Navy ship than a 5-inch gun. Honestly, if they, if they haven't got a 5-inch gun, I do start to question whether they belong to the U.S. Navy. But that's just the bias coming from the gun period for me. The fact that they end up as classified as cruisers again is... Well, it's the fun of the game, isn't it? But, I have to admit, I have been slightly naughty. Because normally, I would pick on the missile system they are originally fitted with. And originally, they're fitted with the exact same missiles as the Lehi classes. They're, fi they're fitted with the Terriers. Makes sense. And then in the 1980s, they get upgraded to RIM-67, which is the standard missile, but a variant of the standard missile. There is the RIM-66, which is medium range, standard, standard, I would call it. And there is the RIM-67 ER, or extended range missile. So, they get them, and then in 1990s, they get upgraded to the SM-2 from the SM-1. And so I'm going to talk about the standard missile system, because I like the standard missile system. It's kind of like the standard class battleship. It's a great name for you to get. And I, I do sometimes think when the US Navy was naming their missiles, they were going, look back in history. If we call something standard, it might be the best, the most successful missile in the world. It might be quite expensive, but because it's called standard... They won't think it's excessively expensive. They'll think it's the standard. Yeah. It's a great name for saying, yes, we're buying something expensive, but it's the standard. And buying anything else is the not standard, or otherwise known as below standard missile. It's a great thing. And honestly, to my mind, it's exactly why the US Navy has continued on with the standard missiles train in that... They're all called standard missiles. Even to this day, the, the, the new missiles are standard missiles. You know, they went from having a, a naming convention where they were naming things with different names to going, they're all going to be standard missiles. They might be different RAMs. Yes. You know, we've got the new one, which is the RIM-161 standard SM-3. And... The RIM-174 standard extended range active missile. But still, or otherwise known as the SM-6, they're still standard missiles. <laughs> you think about that. There have now been, at least, well, many more than six. But six that they've actually, they've reached six points where they've officially had to go, this is sufficiently different enough missile, we're going to have to differentiate this. But they started off by calling them the SM-1, and then the SM-2. It's it's a brilliant system of making it sound like you're not doing anything new. Oh, we're just ordering the latest version of standard missile. It's nothing new, it's nothing expensive, it's not excessive. You know. Yes, it's a two-stage missile, with both a booster stage and a second stage. Yes, it's a development of the R156, but, you know, we've got the R161, and, you know, uh, th there are all these sort of different sort of variations. We've been evolving. Yes, yes. It's all perfectly standard. And I just love it. It's just one of the smartest things they've got going on. Yes, as I've said in other videos, I've got 
I'm planning on growing the channel this year. Um, if I wanted to expand it more, which I probably will do, because probably there are going to be people who are going to go, oh, da 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 this. I want to expand the channel. I want to expand the history of it. I want to write books which I'll publish on Kindle, and I want to keep them down to about... I'm working out what price point I'll stick them at. I'm thinking £7.50 or something like that. Nothing too much, but that means I'm going to have to find the publication rights for books, uh, for pictures, etc. I, I can't... Well, I, I know Drac would still be... Drac NFL and his channel, he'd still be incredibly generous with his, uh, his archive of pictures, and I can always go back to him, but I don't want to keep relying on his generosity, because that... That seems like taking advantage of friendship. Helping you out because when you're looking for your first book and all the pictures and it's turning around, the pictures are about 600 or 700 pounds to get access to some of the pictures you want to use. And your friend turns around and goes, I've already got those and I've got the originals so you can use mine. That's something, but that's one thing. Doing it for lots of books afterwards, that's a bit wrong. So basically, I'm plugging the channel, I am plugging my store, which has all sorts of cool t-shirts out. I am going to start buying more of them. Currently, I have my favourite orange ones, which I do all my recording in. And I do realise I've got to spend some time in the gym, because I've either got to do that, or I've got to order new for new um, new shirts, and I'm going to be doing gym time instead. There you go. In orange. Not as if that's the channel's official colour. And, um, yes, the book I've got out with pen and sword. Which is lovely. I really love writing that book. But, as I said, I want to do some books which are going to be on Kindle and other e-readers. And they're basically going to be open as much as I can. I'm going to have to pay a few things to get them through. But the plan is to start off with about four books two ones on classes, flower class corvettes and new class submarines from the Royal Navy. I'm tempted to call them the Royal Navy's U-boats, but the Royal Navy did actually operate some U-boats they captured, so that would kind of be yeah, misinformation. So I, I, I'm not going to do that. Um, and yeah, to uh, a Naval con a director of naval construction and a third sea lord. So starting off that series as well. Probably not starting off that series at the beginning because let's be honest, the two names at the beginning very few people know about or remember and I want them to sell enough that I can then use the money to fold into the next books and next books and to basically grow, as said, the channel, grow the, uh, grow the books, do more of that because I think it's sensible. It's good for public-facing history. It's good because I want to do more of that, and I want to make that slightly more accepted and slightly more visible. But also, it's good for... in terms of me, and this is being entirely selfish, but also very honest, it's good for... it's going to provi hopefully provide me with a sort of consistency of income which enables me to, I don't know, set up my own place. I'm considering where I might live, whether it will be continuing to be as close to London as it is. Honestly, it's very expensive when you're over in the, within the M25. And the amount of money I need to live off on outside London is a lot different than the amount of money I need to live on inside London. And, uh, yeah. It, it'll be interesting. But it's, it's sort of working out those things. And any place, of course, I do set up needs to have significant space for my books. And then there's all the research trips. And this year, of course, planning a trip to Australia. So many things. So basically, you need to make the channel work. You need to make everything work. And make it as self-supporting and hopefully... This is going to sound strange. Supporting, but also providing enough income to grow it. That's the plan. That is the plan. And thank you for everything. It wouldn't be possible to be where I am without you guys. And girls. And everyone. I'm honestly not quite sure. 
it, it's one of the strange things in that I know from the number of comments I get and messages on Discord and other things, I have quite a lot of female viewers. And I know from the fact that my cousins are all subscribed, etc. I have female viewers. But, according to my analytics, no. And I wondered about that. Because apparently female is 0.7%. But there again, I checked out some of my cousins who have anonymized accounts on the system. I, they haven't re revealed their gender. And it seems to presume they're male because they like engineering and they like history. So I do wonder whether there is a thing going on with the analytics. But we'll leave that to one side. Into the Belknap and Truxton class. Now, interesting enough... Truxton isn't actually laid down before Belknap, so it's unlike the previous class's experience with their nuclear vessel. But this is again, there are nine nuclear and non nuclear and one nuclear. So again, it's a 10% nuclear ratio. Which actually, I know, I've asked the question in the previous video. What, uh, you know, would. What would a modern U.S. Navy, what would a nuclear version of an army work? If the U.S. Navy had managed to keep the process of, we will build 10 of, a batch of 10, and of those, one will be nuclear in every batch. How would that affect the modern U.S. Navy? If you think about that, that would mean every U.S. carrier would have at least one nuclear escort, but nuclear-powered escort in their battle groups. And if you kept it up with the TCOs as well, you know, you could be talking... A dozen or so nuclear-powered vessels in service. A surface escorts. For starters, I think that might have eased the introduction of things like railguns and lasers because the significant power output. Whilst I don't agree with a commenter on one of my recent videos that fusion power will break, will make, is the only thing that's going to make lasers work. I don't think so. I think in the nicest way we need to get more efficiencies in the laser systems. We need to work, crack a lot of problems in that area so we can actually get more of the power that's being put into the system out of the system. But, yeah. It's interesting. It is interesting. But now, this class, where well, we have Belknap, Joseph Daniels, Wainwright, all done by Bath Ironworks, in Bath. Jouet, done in Puja, uh, <coughs> uh, Sound Naval Shipyard, along with um, Sterrett, which and Fox, which for some reason are underlined. Let me check that. Why have I underlined them? Is it in my notes? Well. Honestly have no idea why they were underlined. Well, other than I've got a sweet impression of Aircraft call signs. <sighs> My own notes sometimes. But no. Um, William H. Stanley, Bath Ironworks again. And Biddle, Bath Ironworks. And Truxton this time was the New York Shipbuilding Corporation Camden. Why is this interesting? Well, let's compare it to the previous class, the Lehys. Now. You'll notice they again have a lot of theirs completed by Bath Ironworks. But who's missing? Quincy! Quincy haven't got a nuclear build haven't got the nuclear build. Truxton has gone to the New York Shipbuilding Corporation, who previously did the conventional. They did two of the conventionals. Dale and Richard K. Turner. Bath Ironworks seems to have really picked up. They've got five they've got five vessels. Todd has got one again. Puget has gone from one to two. That's nice. San Francisco has got one. But Lockheed has also gone. So two shipyards have disappeared from the construction group. I.e. that's two shipyards which, let's be honest, because they will have been still constructing at this point, because they're constructing still these vessels, which don't have the capacity to take on more builds. Or are losing out in the order race to Bath Ironworks, which is starting to become the mega lift that it is to this day. It's 
It's interesting. Then we have <coughs> the differences in the class. Truxton is actually again lighter than her pre uh, than the previous nuclear counterpart. Which if we go, which if I activate this little thing, you'll see as of course is Brain Ridge. Brain Bridge. I keep going on Brain Bridge. I don't know why. And Belknaps are about the same displacement. Again, these are single-ended ships. Okay, so the previous class were double-ended missile ships. They had a missile launcher at both ends. These have a single missile launcher. They have missiles launched at the front, on the bow. They, in turn, therefore have a gun at the, on the aft, on the quarterdeck. Now, this gives them advantage, an advantage when it comes to helicopter operations. It does. Because, honestly, the gun takes up less space than all the assembly facilities for the missiles. It does. Sounds weird to say it, but it does. One five-inch gun. Mm-hmm. Uh, Twenty RU-5 Azeroth anti-submarine missiles fired from the Mark 10 launcher. One Mark 10 Mod 7 guided missile system with 40 SM-2 ER missile standard missiles. By the time they fit, uh, they are in their final configuration. So that's another thing to think about these ships. They're designed and they have space built into them. And middle the get the great advantage of the standard missile system is it does fit into the slots of the Terrier system to an extent. And it is upgradable to, uh, from the Terrier to the standard missile quite easily. But still, they are an adaptable and growable design. On less than 8,000 tons, in the case of the Belknap, on less than 9,000 tons in the Truxton. They are an adaptable and upgradable design. That's a useful to think about. They're not exactly the fastest vessels either. And Truxton, technically, has more shaft horsepower and a lower t uh, and lo uh, displaces less is slightly mm, well about as long as the Bainbridge, and yet is supposedly slower. So either someone is mucking around with the official figures, which, considering this was built during the Cold War, I would not be surprised, or someone has seriously mucked up her turbines and reactors. And they are incredibly inefficient at turning the power of these and into the, uh, they turn it into this power and then they don't deliver that power to the screws via the shaft somehow. Somehow, something's going wrong somewhere. Because, again, 85,000 shaft horsepower for a top speed of 32 knots and yet the previous class figures were very different. Admittedly, it could be the previous class which had the figures wrong. Could be. Be sure your lies will find you out. Especially when you lie on official figures. Because someone will come back and look at them and go, Excuse me? Hmm. Mark 42, 5 inch 54 caliber gun. Again, as said, you cannot find anything more standard for the US Navy than a 5-inch gun. I have to say, I am always slightly disappointed that this is a single gun turret. I feel it should be a twin. I feel having a twin 5-inch 54 be good. But that might be because I like the 5-inch and I like twin mounts. I can understand, though, why you're going for a single one. Especially when, to an extent, you're carrying the gun as a... We're having it because it gives us a dual-purpose backup weapon. Originally equipped for two on-mount gunners. One surface, one anti-aircraft. But the anti-aircraft gunner position was scrapped later on when the... 
speed of naval aircraft and attacking aircraft made manual aiming of the anti-aircraft weapons impractical. Yeah, that makes sense. Eventually, the Mark 42 uh, is replaced, of course, by the Mark 45, which is listed as being a lightweight mount. Because, well, this mount, etc., weighs in at 61.4 tons. The Mark 45 lightweight one weighs in at 22.5. This one's heavy. But it serves on the Northampton. It's used on the Forrestal class aircraft carrier, which was later removed. The Belknap class cruisers and the USS Truxton, of course, which we're talking about. The Charles F. Adams class destroyer, the Farragut class destroyer, the Forrest Sherman class destroyer, the Mitchell class destroyer, the Lux class frigate. Which I'm fairly certain at a certain point, yeah. The Perth class destroyer, which of course modified Charles F. Adams. Um, the Lucian's class destroyers, which also modified Charles F. Adams. Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Force used on the Keys, the Hatakazi, Haruna, Takasuki, Takasuki, and the Shireen. Lots of people wanted this gun and used this gun because it was very reliable. And, by the way, if you want, happen to be anywhere near HMS Brisbane, well... When I say new era, near HMS Brisbane, HMS Brisbane, if you happen to be wandering around and you see a sign saying HMS Brisbane's gun this way, you'll find her gun has been preserved. Because the Australians seem to like preserving guns off ships. They seem to have a rather large number of them sitting around places. If I was ever attacking Australia, I'd be very worried by the number of ships' guns which seem to be preserved and just sat near random bases. Because, you know, it doesn't take much to probably, hopefully, get them working, considering they're designed for a life at sea with all salt water. So, nice atmosphere Australia might well have made sure things work okay. And a few little tweaks, and suddenly that base has a, for a fair number of miles around it, a zone of, you come within range, you will not be within range for long. So... Today, when we think about the standard missile, we think about this VLS position where it's all assembled, sitting in the VLS tube, ready to go. But, yes, there was a period, believe it or not, when it came into life when it was like this, when it was assembled aboard ship. Which is a fun thing to think about. This actually is the SM2 extended range on the USS Mahan. Now, standard missile system. Ah, that's fun. Right, so, the idea was to replace Terrier, Talos, and Tata guided missile systems. They used the same fuselage as the Tata missile for easier adaptation of existing launches and missiles and magazines. They used the guided Mark 74 Tata guided missile fire control system as its base. And... Basically, everything is designed to be a radically different missile internally, which is development and all the latest electronics, but externally it's supposed to still fit in those systems. It's still supposed to fit on the launchers. And then you have the RIM-67. And basically, the extended range missile managed to replace the Talos, uh, Talos, which was the long-range missile, with a missile the size of the Terrier missile system. And because it was still in the form of the Tata, it actually could fit in the place of the older Rim 2 Terriers. It was very good, but believe it or not, the ships which converted were still referred to as Terrier ships. And the whole point of this standard missile was it's supposed to be able to use the Aegis combat system and the new threat upgrade program in order to get those systems, those ships, from Terrian Tartar ships, 
to be as upgraded as capable as possible for dealing with the current emerging air threat. So when they started coming to service, these are realization A, missiles need to improve, B, the threat has changed and evolved, and C, this is going to be any uh, this is going to be something we're going to have to fix. We have to have a system that works. Now, their deployment, Long Beach class, Farragut class, Lehigh class, Bainbridge, of course, Belknap class, and Truxton, and Vittorio Veneto, all got variations of them. Usually starting off with the SM1ER, and then moving on to the SM2ER. So, these systems, these weapons, they have an operational range, and this is for the SM2ER of roughly 65 to 100 nautical miles. But the Block 4, one of the more recent ones, has a range of 100 to 200 nautical miles. They can go Mach 3.5 and have a flight ceiling of 80,000 feet, roughly. Radar proximity and contact fuse, high explosive. Again, one of the things which sort of disappears slowly is the idea of using a nuclear warhead. However, I have a very strong suspicion that some of the earlier variants might well have had that capacity. It would seem to me quite possible in the area where they were still expecting mass bomber and missile strikes that they might think actually sending a nuclear warhead into them would be a sensible idea. There again, there was also the period of MAD coming in quite quickly, and they might have decided that actually you use one nuclear weapon, you're going to let all of them out of the bag. That would actually be quite sensible. This is Belknap after she collided with the John F. Kennedy. <clears throat> now, thankfully, this was not her only high point of her career. She did actually do a few other more interesting things. And she even played a role in the Malta summit between George Bush and Mikhail Gorbachev. That's the first President George Bush. And yes, that is the Soviet leader. The last Soviet leader. During this point, the Soviet delegation used the Slava. Bush, along with his advisors, used the Belknap. The meetings took place on the Maxim Gorky, which was a cruise ship which was anchored in the harbour at La Valletta. So, you know, Everything put together nicely in a NATO country, but on a Soviet cruise ship. Both nations having escorts there. Considering it's 1989, the Slava's a good one to have brought along. Not sure about the choice of the Belknap. I think the Belknap deserves to be there. I think it's a good ship. But... I am surprised it wasn't one of the newer vessels or one of the nuclear-powered cruisers. Something to one-up the situation. There again, considering the scenario in the Soviet Russia at that time, they could well have decided that it was um, appropriate not to raise tensions by bringing something more powerful. Then we have the Josephus Daniels, which I have to admit, I was looking up and going, the previous class were all named after very important personnel. People who were either heroes or were senior officers. And Josephus Daniels was an American newspaper editor and publisher from the 1880s until his death, who controlled Raleigh News and Observer. He also served as a Democratic politician for President Woodrow Wilson. And as such, please note, he was Secretary of the Navy during World War One. 
he's such an important Secretary of the Navy, I'd actually completely forgotten he was called Joseph S. Daniels. Well, actually, no, I hadn't. I thought he was called Joseph Daniels. So, hey, you learn something new every day, and sometimes you relearn that what you thought you knew was wrong. That he was called Josephus, not rather than Joseph. It could have been worse. I could have got completely the wrong career, uh, wrong name. What I do love is that by 1994, we're not sure when it happens, but by 1994, the nickname for the ship is the Joey D. And to my mind, therefore, the fact is, when it is struck from the registry in 1994, decommissioned in January 1994, I have decided the character of Joey in Friends is named for this ship in honor of it. it uh, Friends starts in 1994. This ship is decommissioned and got rid of in 1994. This was the Joey D. Joey becomes a big part of Friends. Joey D always got the girl. Joey always got the girl. Joey D had basically... Well, actually, many, many talents, whereas Josie, uh, Joey would just say, How are you doing? That's where the similarities sort of start to break down. But, see, Joey, Joey, Friends, 1994. And now, whenever you watch Friends, you can wind someone up by giving them that little sort of story. USS Wainwright. Now, again... I was kind of interested in this one because I thought, why are the US Navy naming a ship after someone who wrote a book on walking around the UK? Wainwright Walks. And again, it's not. It's named for the American Wainwright family, who might well be connected, because I can't see Wainwright being that common a name. Honestly, I can't. There, 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 there seems to be a distant relation or something going on, I'm fairly sure, because Wainwright... Uh, a clerk is fairly common. There are a lot of clerks. As as some of the other names in my family. One of them includes Browning. So they're fairly common. Wainwright? No. Not so common. But he's named to honour the Wainwright family of service to the Navy, which is Jonathan Matthew Mayhew Wainwright, 1821 to 1863. There was another Jonathan Ma Ma Mayhew Wainwright, 1849 to 1870. Richard Wainwright, who was an American Civil War naval officer. Richard Wainwright, another one, Spanish-American War naval officer. And Richard Wainwright, a third one, who won a Medal of Honor. So frankly, yes, I can see why this family is deserving of a ship named after them. But my question is, why isn't there a whole flotilla named after them? Because surely, with the ability to pick roughly... Well, you can name six ships, but that's, two di that's only two different... No, five ships, and that's two different names... You could at least get two out of it. Or you could call it Jonathan Wainwright the first, Jonathan Wainwright the second, Richard Wainwright the first, Richard Wainwright the second, and Richard Wainwright the third. And call it the Rain White Frotilla. Again, interesting little career. Highlights probably her many visits to Japan. Spends a lot of time acting as. Um, <clears throat> Well, how do I put this politely? Positive identif identification radar advisory zone duties in the Tolkien Gulf. And has a long Vietnam career, but even managed to get to take part in Operation Praying Mantis. Again, naming operations. Praying Mantis doesn't really come across that well. I know I'm getting slightly picky on operation names. I do realise this and I am watching this as part of my personality. But it's something I'm growing into as I'm getting older and I'm, I'm sticking with it at the moment. Just in case it turns out to be something interesting. If not, then I'll change it and get rid of it. The Jouet. Hmm. She was named after Rear Admiral James Edward Jouet. Okay. Who was an officer for the United States Navy during the Mexican-American War and the American Civil War. So fits with the Wainwright family, definitely. And spends most of her life 
in the Pacific Fleet. It's eventually sunk as a target ship in Exercise Valiant Shield, which is a good name for an exercise. Let's be honest. Let's be honest. Excellent. Exercise. Valiant Shield. You want that on an emblem. You want to have that on a badge somewhere at home. Yes, I took part in Exercise Valiant Shield. I was valiant and a shield. Horn. Name for Frederick J. Horn, who was a four-star admiral on the USN and first vice chief of naval operations. Directed all logistics during World War II. So I can tell you two things. One, he would have been most annoyed he got given a destroyer because those are known for being logistical black holes where their crews make things disappear and always ask for more than they're going to get, than they actually are supposed to have and find ways of getting it and making all your other stuff disappear. And two, he's a logistics officer. Where is his auxiliary? He wants to be controlling the supply. Not the one making the supply disappear. You don't do this to a logistics officer. The poor man spent the entirety of World War II trying to get the US Navy to do something approaching a sensible, uh, appro approaching a sensible logistics plan. This included Halsey and Sprunt. Can you imagine the level of arguments that would have gone on trying to get Halsey to sign off on logistics forms? And then you give him a destroyer? Yes, I know it's a destroyer leader. Yes, I know it's later classified as a cruiser. But that doesn't improve things. That's just going to make more paperwork. And that's going to change theoretical allocations as it goes from destroyer to cruiser level. Which is going to make logistics even more difficult. You're just being cruel to the man. And then the motto. Audace, toujours l'audace. Audacity, always audacity. No logistics officer wants to hear that. That is basically the appropriations cause guide to life. Oh, we just happened to appropriate this. We found this on the back of a truck. It was just sitting on the side of the dock. It just appeared in the hold, sir. Audacity, always audacity. No, logistics. Forms always forms. Do the battleshipping paperwork. It is not fair to do this to a poor man's memory. He was responsible for sorting out the logistics of the US Navy. And you gave him a destroyer. What kind of evil is this? I don't care what you claim he came from. He was logistics at the end. <laughs> these people, th these ships, caused him nothing but stress. And then you name one after him. I feel so sorry for the man. I feel just, I, I just don't understand. It's just, it's just cruelty. And then we had Sterrett, which is named for Andrew Sterrett who was a naval officer during the Quasi-War with France and the Barbary Wars, commanding the schooner USS Enterprise in both conflicts. At this point, when I heard this, I thought, right then, so the Sterrett is going to spend most of her life with the USS Enterprise. That is the only sensible thing. And I've read through her career, and I cannot find her, despite the fact she has bases sometimes in the Far East and in the Pacific and is wandering all over the place, her serving with the Enterprise once. So I, this is the question of this video, actually. Not the question which I'm tempted to do, which I'm probably repeating myself from earlier, is that what do you think the US Navy would look like today if it had gone with the policy of 1 in 10 will be nuclear, nuclear escorts? I had done Arlie Burke's nuclear escorts, etc. There seems to be most people seem to have taken that question as an, a, a point to argue. No, 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 they wouldn't have done. They wouldn't have done this. I, I know the odds are against it, especially with the people in charge of nuclear power who were in charge of nuclear power. But if for some reason those people had not been in charge, or let's say those people had been keener on the idea of surface ships because they felt that would give them control of some of the surface ship procurement 
and allow them to increase their power even more because they therefore have a say over all surface ship procurement because, you know, then it would have to be back compatible between the nuclear escort and its sister ships, which were the conventionally powered vessels and all having the similar weaponry, etc. True empire builder would have spotted that back hole and would have gone, for it, uh, that, gone straight through it to build their empire. Um, then what would they, uh, how would this affect the US Navy today? But no, my question is going to be this. Can you find out, look up anywhere, because I have looked everywhere, to see if this ship ever serves the USS Enterprise? Because I find it absurd if she didn't. The US Navy missed an absolute trick. And again, more cruelty to the Sterrett name. But no. Had a good career, did most of the stuff in North, uh, in off the Gulf of Tonkin again. Uh, these ships have very good air defense kits, and they make sense being sent into the Gulf of Tonkin. It's the closest thing you've got to an active war zone from naval perspectives. I know it is an active war zone, but let's be honest, the North Vietnamese Navy isn't really going to be fighting the American Navy anytime soon and coming out in any shape but one piece. I think the US Navy could probably turn up with a OHP and could have quite happily done got rid of them, let alone anything heavier. But uh, no, the Sterrett, etc. and the systems like this, and they're good there. They've got their 5-inch gun at the back. If anything does turn up, they can make that go away. Uh, later on, they have harpoon missiles and standard missiles, and let's be honest, ASROC as well. And all these things have various options. Plus, of course, the uh, phalanx. All gives them extra cap capabilities. The William H. Stanley? Mm hmm. So, Stanley. Now, he was Chief of Naval Operations 1933 to 37. He was also the U.S. Ambassador to the Soviet Union from 1941 until 1943. So, he is a man who has a very high tolerance for hubris, a very high tolerance for dealing with the hot air which comes from politics, and worked very, very hard at managing things. She, the ship was actually sponsored by his daughter, uh, Mrs., uh, who by that point was Mrs. Charles B. Wincoke, but I'm Pretty sure that her first name wasn't Charles. I'm I'm pretty sure it wasn't. In fact, if you just do a little bit of digging, you soon find out the daughter's actual name was Vivian. In fact, Vivian Beatrice Wincoke. So, depending on your perspective, the name of Vivian. Speaking as someone who has two cousins, one who has uh, both who have the name, one who loves it, and one who hates it. It's either a nice thing to be called Mrs. Charles Wincoat, or it's a terrible thing. But he, the reason I was looking up was because I knew he had actually more daughters, and I wasn't sure which one ended up that surname. I knew he had a Vivian, he had a Helen, a Marie, an Evelyn, and a son called William. And I wanted to know which daughter it was, because I... And this kind of per this kind of historian, I like to know. I the, in any work I do, trust me, I know a whole chestful of facts which will never make it into the book, which are completely useless for anything because no one's ever going to even ask them in the most random quiz. And yet I look them up because I want to know just not just the information, but the information around the information, around the information, around the information. Completely off the line of march for my. Uh, work, but it's important. So we know that it was launched by William uh, Vivian. <sighs> Again, served in the Vietnam War. There is a common theme going on here. Also was used as a target ship. Sunk in, uh, sunk in operation, uh, well, exercise, Talisman Sabre. Again, a good name for an exercise, Talisman Sabre. Sounds a decent name. She did lose her helicopter at one point in the Atlantic, so. Um, but managed to rescue all but four of the crew. No. All but one of the four crew. Sorry. 
USS Fox. Now, again, I was thinking, hmm, must be named for something of a foxy nature. It is, but it's actually named of, uh, for Gustavus Vassa Fox, who was an officer in the USN who served in the Mexican-American War and Assistant Secretary of the Navy during the Civil War. Again, didn't have logistics duties, so wouldn't have I wouldn't object to having a destroyer named after him, let, let alone someone which then eventually becomes a cruiser. He's had three ships that are named after him: a torpedo boat, a Clemson class destroyer, and then the Belknap class destroyer leader, eventually cruiser. After the stroke of a pen, makes him so. Interesting ships. Getting better. I'm hoping his next vessel is... Well, I'm guessing it's going to be some kind of DDGX. You never know. They might make it CGX. Or those just might be the one in ten which are nuclear powered. When they decide, hang on. We really do want to get rail guns and lasers into service and we can't cure at the moment because we can't get batteries to work to the requirements of or um, our systems work to require our systems. So we're going to have to go back to having nuclear reactors. Get one off the carriers. Ouch! That'd be a very big reactor for a small ship. <clears throat> a very big reactor for a small ship. A very, very big reactor. Then we have USS Biddle. Now... I won't say what I decided the call sign of the helicopter for this ship would be, but I had the, uh, my view would be it has to be the Biddy or something like that. But yeah. he was one of the five captains of the Continental Navy who was ra who was joined the uh, ra uh, who was empowered by the uh, Continental Congress during the American Revolutionary War. He was born in Philadelphia in 1750. At the age of 13, he joined the Royal Navy when he was 20. In 1773, he sailed in the Arctic with Constantine Phipps and Horatio Nelson. Apparently. Although, at that point, I will add, Nelson was 14 years old. And still had command of one of the smaller boats of ships. One well, on smaller, you know, small boats of the ships. It's nice to know that Nelson's around, but I doubt Nelson's had much effect on Biddle at that point because Biddle was in his twenties and Nelson was fourteen years old. So I kind of don't think they're going to have that much in common, other than learning the uh, learning naval life. Um, but joining as a midshipman at twenty. Well, he began sailing at the age of 13 and joined the Royal Navy when he was 20. He's probably still going to be a midi. I doubt that the Royal Navy is unlikely to do a direct commission to lieutenant. And, yeah. He was put in command of an armed galley, the Franklin. In Pennsylvania. But then he ends up with this vessel named after him. And it's not the first one either. He also had a torpedo boat. And a Wix class destroyer. And... Well, how do I put this piety? He got a Charles F. Adams class guided missile destroyer. Which was renamed to Claude Ricketts. Then his name was transferred to this vessel. And... There is another vessel, which is also named Biddle, which was in response, uh, which was named for Major General William P. Biddle of the U.S. Marine Corps. So there are two Biddles. There have been five Wainwrights. There is only one ship named Wainwright. But there are two Biddles and each gets their own ship. I feel cheesed off for the Wainwrights now. I mean, it's a it's a nice ship, but five Wainwrights get one ship between them. Biddle gets one ship each. 
There's something wrong going on here. Biddle also has a fairly active career. A fairly active career. Takes part in Desert Shield and Desert Storm as well before her end. But, unlike the others, wasn't involved in a Syncex, was scrapped. And then we get to Truxton. Now, Truxton is named for Thomas Truxton, who was an American naval officer just after the Revolutionary War. Uh, during that war, he served as a privateer. Uh, he managed to rise to the rank of Commodore in the late 18th century and served in the Quasi-War with France. He was one of the first six commanders appointed to the U.S. Navy by President Washington, and during his career, he con commanded the U.S.S. Constellation, Constellation and the U.S.S. President. In civilian life, he became involved in local politics and was elected as sheriff. So, I was a close friend of President Ulysses S. Grant. Um, well, no. One of his... He, no. He, one of his grandsons became close friends of President Ulysses S. Grant. That makes more sense. Who had a very similar... Oh, good Lord. How many... What is it people naming their people so similar? By the way, thank you to the U.S. Navy's G uh, uh, U.S. Navy family genealogy, uh, geo um, genealogy website. You really do make my life easy for doing these researches on the people's names. <sighs> but no, Truxton, the nuclear powered. Again, single-ended, so missiles only one end, rather than double-ended. Basically, if you're single-ended, you have your missiles all one, a front, one end, usually front. If you're double-ended, you have them both ends. And along with Long Beach and Brainbridge, constitutes the third of the one-ship nuclear classes. Powered by the same D2G reactors as Bainbridge. Then the, the speed really doesn't make sense. The, the speed, the top speed really doesn't make sense. But you'll be glad to know, and this is the real thing, get, Truxton spends quite a lot of time with Enterprise, as does, of course, Bainbridge. I'm feeling more and more like the U.S. Navy doesn't think about the naming of their ships and where they're deploying them, because it seems cruel to me that that ship named for someone who had commanded an Enterprise doesn't get anywhere near Enterprise, yet Truxton, named for someone who commanded Conservation and President, so really didn't care about Enterprise, spends his life with Enterprise, and with Enterprise. And actually, at one point, served as an anti summary warfare school ship. That was not something I was expecting to remember or find in my notes again. I remember now writing it and double checking that one. But yes, it happened while she was um, acting as plane guard for Ranger, Kitty Hawk, Enterprise, and Yorkton simultaneously while they, the carriers conducted landing qualifications for their pilots. The, usually it was in series as they were going in and out, and it was rare they were all four together for that four-month period. But during that, and then in that, just after that period, and this is in 1968, she does the anti-submarine warfare school. And this, by the way, is a picture of Truxton with Enterprise and Arkansas. 
And Arkansas was, of course, a Virginia-class nuclear-powered cru cru missile cruiser. And that was them doing what they called Operation Sea Orbit, Orbit Memorial, on the commemorating the 25th anniversary of Sea Orbit. Nineteen eighty nine. Which again seems to me kind of strange they didn't manage to have um Bainbridge which was still in service and Long Beach which was still in service go back for that, but you know, again you could have I suppose if you'd had all the same ships in there, it might look like the US Navy hadn't bothered to buy any new ships in the meantime, and the ships were, would make the point they're all 25 years old. I can understand why not now. For, thinking about it, I can understand why not, but still. So, what is the point in doing this like this? What is the point in building ships and then building one nuclear variant? Well, it allows you to truly test out whether the nuclear capabilities gives you anything more. Because the ship is pretty much exactly the same as all the rest, other than having nuclear power. Now, there are lots of cost reasons for nuclear being annoying, and there are lots of difficulties with disposal. However... It does make logistics, to an extent, easier. And when you've got nuclear-powered carriers, okay, they're functionally massively useful, and they can carry fuel for their escorts. But one more, one escort which they don't have to worry about fueling can make a difference in that task group. Especially if that's one escort which can guarantee to keep up with you. Which was honestly the same of the Uries in the US Navy, especially, were trying to give to keep their Virginias and other cruisers in nuclear cruisers in service, pointing out that logistically it made a lot of sense. Now, when the US Navy didn't have an opponent who was really matching up to them or anyone who was squaring up to them, you could make the case quite easily based on cost that there was no need to justify the expense. I'm not sure I'd agree with that now. I can understand the point that some people will make would be, well, you know, you should have a separate class which is all nuclear powered. And that does to an make sense to me, but I would also say that considering the variance between the Flight 1 and the Flight 3 Burks, Making a class or perhaps a subclass of Burks, which you built at a 1 to 10 ratio, which was a Burke command control system, Burke weapons fit, Burke everything else, on probably a Burke, a modified Burke hull with a nuclear reactor in it, would seem to me not to be that difficult. And especially when you consider the sheer number of Burks you're building. It would have then meant the only difference you'd have is the training cycle for those people. And whilst that does expand the amount of training you need, one of the shortages the US Navy never really has, especially when people understand the sheer earning power once they've completed their service in the US Navy, they have a difficulty maintaining a hold of people in the service, but they don't have a difficulty of getting people to sign up for the training and staying in the service for their first couple of tours, usually, is nuclear engineers. Because those nu nuclear engineers, when they retire from the US Navy, can usually write their own paycheck as far as the nuclear industry is concerned, because naval engineers reactor engineers, are incredibly well trained. And that's a lot of training done for you by the government.
Now, saying that, there are issues for a nuclear, uh, nuclear-powered ship. As said, I was very surprised to read of trucks, and I went and did more than the checking it being used as the anti-submarine warfare escort, because honestly, to my mind, using a nuclear-powered ship as your ASW ship seemed like a lot of noise. But then I remembered, hang on, nuclear-powered submarines often hunt other submarines, and that makes sense. And then I sort of thought of thinking through a few other things, and actually you can probably make a nuclear reactor pretty darn quiet if you want to. Especially modern ones. And then you have a lot of power. A lot of power for processing. You have virtually unlimited power. In terms of your needs. Something becomes very attractive, actually. And you then also remember that the Kirov class... One of the programs which were fed into them was actually a nuclear-powered anti-submarine warfare vessel. It all becomes very interesting once you start thinking that through. They were a good class. I'm not quite sure I agree with all their naming. As said, there is one in particular. I feel the naming was Cruelty. I, I I am not sure who really disliked poor Admiral Thorn. I, I I feel there was some cruelty going on there. I believe he deserves a ship named after him. I do. A carrier. I would happily sign off on. A LPH. Or LHD. Yes. Big amphibious ship. Definitely. Logistic ship. Very happily. Why be cruel and give the poor man a destroyer? Even if you do later make it a cruiser, that still starts out as a destroyer. No. But getting back to the serious conversation. You can test out the differences in terms of fits, etc., and whether nuclear power is an advantage. But also... And Here's the big thing. It makes it more difficult for an opponent to work out whether that carrier got the nuclear escort or it's got a conventional escort. And there's a difference. Because I have to start adjusting how long I think that battle group can operate for based on how long I think it can keep its escorts, etc., supplied for. And yes, you can say, well, you can attack the logistic ships, etc. And all these things to limit its operational capacity and make sure it can't operate indefinitely. I will be going after that anyway. But I really, for my purposes in when I want to time in my attack, if I want to take out such a group, I want to know when they reach the bingo point. I want to know at what point they have to start calling in escorts and rearranging escorts to refuel them. And one nuclear-powered escort in that group makes that slightly different. Because it means there's one escort which doesn't have to be called in. Two? That makes my life more problematic. Past that point, you pretty much pulled in all your nuclear escorts to one carrier battle group. At which point you've pretty much made the point that that's your primary strike acid. Or you're doing an Arc Royal in the whole tra attack on Taranto scenario and you are trying to draw my eyes away from everywhere else. But either way, I'm probably going to have to watch the entire nuclear-powered escort or nuclear-powered battle group. That's probably going to be worrying me on se several levels. In the in sort of late 1980s when they'd be grouped together. It'd be a case of, okay, so you've got... Um, you have how many escorts? You have both Virginias. You have both Californias. You have Belknap, Truxton, and um, Long Beach. So you have seven escorts. Okay. And you're all grouped around Enterprise. Okay. That's quite a hefty group to be bearing down on anyone. That's that's not really a group I want to be dealing with in the mid to late 1980s. 
it, it it's the sort of group which would give me I don't know issues um, but it would also be as I said painting a target on that group they would be your most mobile task group because literally the fuel they would need would be fuel for aircraft and food for their crews so that is a task group which you could send herring down around South America and do a completely out of the way long range strike to try and avoid being spotted your movements by satellites and everything because again most people seem to think of satellites as it can spot the whole world. A satellite isn't doesn't tend to be positioned to watch the whole world. And if it is, that's a very high altitude satellite. It's a long way away. Most satellites, because you want to get some detailed information, etc., they're going to be closer. They're watching a portion of the world. And remember, they're going around and around. So if you go out of the area completely, you disappear. And I ever have to retask my satellites to watch you, in which case it might make me less capable to watch the areas I have to watch, because they're the areas which are requiring importantly, or I have to launch other satellites. I can do both of those, but those are both actions you force me to have to do. There are risks and advantages to both. There are consequences to both. And then they can attack from wherever they want. That's the Belknap class. Hope you enjoyed. Thank you very much for watching. Take care.